Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining this afternoon's uh, session on uh, um, racial diversity in uh, recruitment and selection. Um, wanted to um, start off by introducing our panelists. Um, we'll start by um, introducing um, uh, Dr. Tafara uh, Makuni, who's an aeronautical engineer. Um, she's currently studying a PGCE in uh, secondary education, physics uh, with mathematics. Uh, she graduated back in 2012 um, with distinction in, um, in mechanical engineering in aerospace and uh, aeronautical engineering at Cambridge University, um, their engineering department, and uh, completed her PhD as well in um, uh, jet engine intakes, which was uh, I think a unit that was um, founded by uh, Royce Royce um, PLC, um, and um, following this, um, she was postdoctoral uh, fellow at the uh, Norwegian University of um, Science and Technology uh, before entering the um, the um, aviation and aerospace um, industry. Um, uh, Johannes uh, Scarlett is um, a policy and uh, research advisor at um, the Royal Academy of um, Engineering. She grew up, he grew up in um, in Hammersmith in um, West London. Um, attended school locally, uh, college locally, and um, eventually um, he started to begin volunteering um, at um, various youth clubs uh, locally, and where he developed an interest in issues around equality and social justice. And um, back in 2011, uh, Johannes became uh, uh, began um, campaigning within the black community in the aftermath uh, of the London riots and um, set up a community radio program which is specifically aimed at um, giving voice um, in the media to, to young uh, black people. The following graduation, um, he interned at the London Evening Standard newspaper before um, he was selected uh, for the United States Embassy um, Young Ethnic Minority Leadership Program back in um, 2014. And then at that same year, <coughs> he was um, hired as an intern at the Royal Academy of um, Engineering. And uh, uh, in 2020, um, he worked as one of the principal researchers um, on the Hamilton Commission report um, which uh, on accelerating change, improving representation of black people in UK motor sports. And I um, would also like to introduce um, Jackson Smith, who is the founder and uh, managing director of Fantasy Wings. Um, Jackson started off um, in university. He achieved a degree in aviation engineering with, with pilot studies and spent time um, at university mentoring uh, young people and was a um, senior mentor um, uh, during his university um, years. When he left um, um, education, um, he worked briefly with uh, with young people with severe disabilities where he was responsible for for mentoring and guidance and um, he went on to start a youth organization called fantasy mentoring back in 2015 and this program was aimed at young people across london um, delivering youth programs in in schools uh, to essentially to mentor and uplift um, young people um jackson started um Fantasy Wings back in um, 2019, and um, the program aims to to give BAME uh, individuals an opportunity to enter the aviation industry uh, through various activities and initiatives, which includes obviously mentorships, workshops, training, and um, I think the program now has around 10,000 young people um, and uh, their parents from minority ethnic backgrounds uh, registered, uh, and uh, uh, they're supporting. Um, people basically all over the the, uh, uh, the country uh, they partner with uh, with uh, British Airways Virgin Atlantic Nets um, Air Race World Championships and uh, FTA Global as well and um, would say a few words about myself as well uh, my name is Arpad um, Sakal I'm an aviation lawyer by background originally from uh, Budapest um, Hungary but uh, I have been living in the UK for uh, a long time since um, 2004. I studied um, aviation law, uh, practiced for about four or five years before I went into uh, what I do today, which is um, executive uh, level uh, recruitment, uh, search and selection, which means that 
um, we are retained by organizations who typically have senior level needs, like they need a chief technical officer or a CFO, chief financial officer, um, CEO, chief executive officer. Um, we focus on the on the um, uh, industrial sectors, which includes but is not limited to um, aviation and aerospace. So it's it's uh, energy renewable energy, uh, a broad range of things, other forms of transportation as well, rail, uh, shipping, maritime, so it, it's, it's really a broad uh, um, uh, set of uh, um, in industry sectors that we um, get involved with, basically. And diversity, um, inclusion, uh, equity is a hot topic uh, at the moment. I think um, uh, it doesn't really matter uh, which part of the recruitment and selection uh, landscape you're looking at, whether it's senior level, young uh, professionals, mid-level, there's, uh, there's a lot to um, um, work on and improve um, on this. What we want to do during this session is really um, talk about things like what can recruiters like myself um, do to minimize uh, barriers uh, faced by the uh, by ethnic minorities specifically those who are trying to enter the the aviation and aerospace sectors uh, what are the bias biases um, that exist today i mean uh, algorithms ai in recruitment are not helping the cause um, um, would be really good to just um, hear from the panel as well what experience of unconscious bias uh, they've experienced um, uh, during their um, interviews and, and assessments that they've done previously um, and really discover the various um, routes into a career in the industry that ethnic minorities may not be aware of. It would be really good to just hear from the panelists um, uh, what they are aware and yeah, uh, hopefully we're going to be um, adding a lot of um, um, uh, value here, basically, uh, during this um, uh, this afternoon uh, afternoon session. Um, I would like to start off by really just asking the uh, the panel. Maybe uh, we'll we'll um, um, start with uh, with you, um, Johannes. Um, why does uh, racial diversity and inclusion matter? Why is it such an important um, uh, topic? What what uh, what makes it so high on the agenda? both individuals and organizations? For sure, thank you, Arpad, for the question and, and the introduction as well. Um, I think racial diversity and inclusion matters very much for the same reason that diversity and inclusion matters across all, uh, all, all areas, but I will speak specifically to racial diversity and inclusion. Um, and first of all, I would, I would start with a general um, answer, which is generally there's three reasons why diversity and inclusion matters, which is the legal case, as you all know very well, being a lawyer, um, the business case and the moral case, and I say that in sort of ascending um, order. I think the and, and let me know if you can hear any feedback. Sorry, I could hear a little bit myself. So yeah, so um, the 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 legal case is very much that we have quality laws in this country, and therefore diversity and inclusion has to be taken seriously by companies and businesses because they don't want to be sued. <laughs> the business case is that diversity and inclusion will add benefits to companies and organisations. But I think what really empowers most of us and really gets most of us up who work within diversity and inclusion and want to do diversity and inclusion is the moral case, which is everyone deserves a fair chance um, within life and to, um, to to get equal opportunities. And that is really the basis of why diversity and inclusion matters. Um, I think we could go into detail about the business case and the legal case and all the benefits that you get from diversity and inclusion. But I think at the end of the day, what, what really touches is, is that moral case and about giving people the opportunity that, that we all deserve an equal chance. Um, when we talk about racial diversity, it's very important because quite often it can be missed off. It's one of those areas that is thorny and difficult to speak about for some people. Yeah. And so quite often it's easier to focus on some of the most more easier but, um, or softer targets within diversity. Um, and, and, and obviously that's a bad thing because we cannot ignore the fact that there are issues of racial differentiation, differential outcomes um, depending on your background. And so that, and these have to be addressed and we can only address it through conversation. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's um, um, that's um, that's uh, that's really interesting what you said, and and I think it starts with recruitment basically. That's 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 where the um, the issue starts, I think, uh, and and. Um, um, yeah, I think it's basically the way companies recruit, hire, interview. Um, that's where you, we see most of the, the the biases that are basically just developed and, and uh, favor certain candidates over over others. Um, Tara, what would you what would you add, if anything? 
Um, yeah, so, okay, so what, I, what I'd say maybe is two things. Um, first of all, diversity and inclusion is just important anyway, because we live in such a global society. So, you know, you want to represent the needs of everyone, right? So I do agree with what was said earlier that I think the moral case is the strongest, but yes, obviously there's a business case and the legal case. Um, and I think also, um, so I think that's the main thing I'd say. Um, and in terms of recruitment, like from a business perspective, it also means you have more ideas um, and you can make better use of the resources that you have um, because you're, yeah. you know, generating solutions or ideas or taking from a wider sample. And then so whatever ideas you come up with or the solution will be uh, of net benefit to, to everyone um, because What's slightly dangerous is if, say, a, min a minority end up making a very big decision that affects a lot of other sectors or sort of diversity groups, right? Um, you know, so I think it's a balance. So this is why I, th I think it's the moral case that's probably the strongest for the reason why we should, um, yeah, improve diversity and inclusion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jackson? So why? from my perspective is diversity important in yeah well yeah. I, would, I, I would i would pose the question why isn't diversity important so when you look at a lot of organizations um and aviation related organizations um but not only the aviation sector but let's look at the airline pilot and aviation sector in particular um the workforce is not um as representative as it could be it's not very ethnically diverse and when it comes to having ethnic diversity in an organization, it also brings about important things like diversity of thought, thinking about the way that things are approached, thinking about the way that you cater to different markets and to different customers, um, and also finding different answers um, to solutions that you may not have thought of. Now, if you only have one set of people from one background in life, um, you don't really have that diversity of thought. So every problem you're attacking it in the same way and there might be a better way to do it. I just think that diversity is key because of the fact that there needs to be so many people sitting around the table um, when it comes to affecting change. So that change is not just change for the sake of it, but it's change, change that that makes sense. Do you get what I mean? It's why, yeah. it, why I started Fantasy Wings because if you look at the um, airline pilot industry, 7% um, of pilots, only 7% of pilots are from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and only 3% of women are, are pilot. only 3% of pilots are women and that's not very diverse. Um, so I think diversity is important from the perspective of having a diverse set of thoughts to be able to approach problems and to be able not only problem solve but to cater to different markets and different audiences yeah. um, from the right perspective rather than just um, thinking that, you know, maybe this is the way to do it. It's good to have people around that that know what way it is to do it. So yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. yeah. And just to, just, a, just a quick point, just to touch on that. Um, yeah. I think it's very, when you said um, about diversity of opinion, so sometimes you have to be a, a bit careful when we talk about diversity, right? So, I mean, you could have a panel of people that look diverse, say, right? But they actually have the same opinion, right? So it's also just the idea of, um, having um, diversity of thought, right? Particularly with aviation, it's so global that you know you're serving different markets all over the world. So um, the more um, diversity in opinion you have, the better. Um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yes. I read a survey uh, very recently by by Deloitte, which uh, revealed that. Um, more than 70% of the next gen, the millennials and uh, Gen Z, um, are more likely to stay for more than three, four, five years or more years if they're working for an employer that is perceived to have a diverse workforce. So it's, uh, I think, especially in aviation, um, we talk a lot about gender diversity. We don't really talk about age, um, from my experience, although it should be really something that we address as well. It's a very touchy and, and uh, difficult um, uh, topic because because of um, uh, yeah GDPR regulations and, and yeah I mean you can't really uh, reveal things uh, um, 
um, to potential employers, basically, or you shouldn't. But yeah, I think racial diversity, ethnic diversity, uh, the whole BAME uh, topic, I think it's, it's just a lot of people that I speak to within the sector, I think they are either avoiding the topic uh, or they just uh, pretend that it's basically it's not an issue within their own um, sort of um, um, organization. Basically, that's what I've that's been. Because, yeah. That's because the topic is very uncomfortable um, yeah. for a lot of people. So um, I um, I prefer to use um, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic um, yep. when I'm talking about diversity, and the reason for that is because it's like what you were saying, Tafara. Um, diversity is so different. It it it, it it's based on you could have a lot of people that look diverse and when you were talking about the RPAD, you were saying a lot of organ a lot of people would rather work for organizations that are perceived to be diverse. Um, you could have the perception that an organization is diverse, but the diversity of thoughts um, needs to be um, improved because all these people are from the same background. So I definitely agree with the age, um, the gender, the ethnicity, um, the background. So where, um, what kind of what kind of um, areas and upbringings and, 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 and styles of life um, do people come from where they'll be able to give different, do you get what I mean? Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's really, really, really important that everyone in the room um, is able to contribute something differently because if they can't, then why don't you just hire one person um, if everyone's thinking the same thing? Do you get what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. That's, um, that's, and just, um, that's... Uh, just... Sorry, Alper, just to add on to yeah. it, I think what, what both Tafara and Tafara both, both said, I think they eloquently um, spoke very well about diversity, so I won't add anything else there. I think they've done a very good job. But I think the other side of it, especially when we're speaking about recruitment, is inclusion. And these two things are not interchangeable, though they're quite often spoken about as though they are. And I think inclusion quite often needs to come first before we start looking at diversity, for, especially for those companies that don't have it already. You, if you what you have if you focus just on the diversity what happens is you have people from different backgrounds coming in and quite often they leave quite just as quickly as they came in because they don't feel like the sort of environment the culture in which they're working in allows them to be themselves allow them to reach their full potential and so we do have to speak about inclusion and and, and look at sort of inclusive recruitment practices one thing so from the Hamilton commission research that we've done it was focused on motorsport yes but obviously we had to look broader at engineering I think, especially at areas like aerospace, because aerospace is quite um, in high demand within engineering. And what we find there is actually you have high numbers of ethnic minority people studying at university level. They, they tend not to study perhaps at the Russell Group universities for various reasons. But 25% of the student population are from Black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds. However, when we look at the workforce, that drops down to 9%. And so we have to look at what's going on with the recruitment uh, practices. Yeah. Um, uh, as to why yeah. not getting through, but yeah, sorry, I won't, I won't keep you up too much. Of no, 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 very uh, valid, uh, very points. I wanted to really just touch, touch on this um, unconscious bias. Um, uh, um, thing as well, because we use this term uh, left, right, and center, but I, I, it would be really good to just understand from uh, like. Uh, to hear from you guys what you mean by uh, by this and and have you experienced it and and uh, yeah uh, um, maybe um, uh, Jackson if you start and then um, Johannes um, uh, and uh, yeah uh, so that's a that, that that that's a very broad I think that's a very broad topic it's a very good question actually um, it's 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 automatically assuming um, that because someone um, is from a particular place or they look a particular way um, or because they um, have a particular name um, that yeah. they're gonna want to do this or they're gonna think this or they have nothing value they're not gonna have something of value um, to contribute um, which is, is I, I, I have um, received unconscious bias um, and I think it, it's more to do with um, looking at me and not thinking that because of who I am, um, potentially as, as a black man, um, and maybe sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm quite casual when I'm casual, um, assuming that I'm not qualified to be able to um, speak about aviation or I don't, I, yeah. I couldn't possibly have a, I couldn't possibly have a pilot's license. So it, it really shocks people um, when they hear that I've got my pilot's license and that I, 
I uh, run fantasy wings because they're like, oh, really? Really? It's only when they see me in like a suit. Um, yeah. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. That makes sense now. But on a regular basis, I, I get the fact, I get a lot of shock um, in terms of what I do. And it's only when I start to speak or when you're hearing me speak about a topic um, and I know what I'm talking about, people are like, oh, wow, I wouldn't have expected that. But why wouldn't you have expected that? You get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. I mean, I can relate to that a lot, although I fit the white European sort of uh, uh, description. But the moment I start talking or the moment people see my name and it's, ooh, where, 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 where is that name from? So it's, it's these little uh, nuanced um, uh, experiences that we're, um, it, yeah, that we get on a daily basis, I think. Uh, yeah. I've been to a meeting with someone um, before um, and I was with them um, and it was a white guy and I'm here as a black guy and they assumed sure. he was the one who was running the the organization so when they first reached out to him they went to shake his hand and was like oh what a great um, organization you run um, and then he was like oh no it's him and I'm like hi <laughs> do you get what I mean so wow. it's just yeah, yeah. just looking yeah. at it just just challenging the thinking um, I try, I try not to get uh, um, offended um, by it, but I always find it kind of funny. Like, what would I have to look like for you to assume that I do what I do? Uh, it's it. funny to a certain extent, but I think it's 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 not that funny when it really happens on a regular basis, and you have to really uh, tackle this and and justify yourself um, yeah. on a yeah um, yep. day to day challenge. or week to week. Yeah, yeah, you have to challenge unconscious bias in the workplace. Okay. But, there's so many people that are so talented and they may not um, be what we're used to. Yeah. But we can't yeah, yeah. assume that because, because this person looks like this or because this person speaks like this, that there isn't a lot of intelligence and that there isn't capability there um, and that they need to be micromanaged. So I think micromanagement also comes into it where there's an unconscious bias that um, this person is going to behave like this, so I need to watch yeah. them closely. Um, whereas yeah. you're watching the wrong person because it's the ones that look more um, how you would expect someone in the role to look that kind of thing a bit, you know what I mean? Make it yeah. easier. Exactly, yeah. exactly. exactly. Um, Tafara, what, what would be your um, thoughts on this particular um, issue uh, or um, uh, term, uh, unconscious bias, and uh, what is your experience with, with it, basically, uh, if, if any? Um, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll start with the first part. I think unconscious wise for me it's it's more playing into stereotypes to some extent maybe unfair stereotypes all right so yes per, per, sorry yep, no, yeah yep. for, for example um you know sort of say what jackson said maybe they'll see your name and assume something about you right for example with my name like if you know anything of africa like i came yeah. from i was born in zimbabwe it's a very zimbabwe name all right um you know migrated there so it's sort of i think with unconscious bias it's maybe just based on yeah maybe how you look how you dress whether you've studied you know your educate whatever it is you know to make certain assumptions about someone without yeah and that's it's unconscious it's not like you're you know consciously doing it but you know you've read oh you know probably this and then you know what jackson was saying is that sometimes when you start having conversations with someone they're like oh wow you do aerospace that's really difficult oh that's yeah. interesting yeah. You know? and then that comes as a surprise oh and then it's also like oh but that's quite a male-dominated industry right so you know how did you get it so you know there are things like that you know when yeah. when you yeah. start talking that then come out so it's and it's almost to some extent sometimes when someone is shocked or surprised right then there was some unconscious bias that maybe they haven't actually told you but there's a reason why they think oh wow you know like that's amazing um and it's not no, but also it's not sometimes necessarily a bad thing right because if i met someone who's like you know like i'm an astronaut right regardless of who they are i think wow that's pretty amazing you know so i think it's also um you know sometimes when we talk about bias there's maybe a negative connotation associated with it but then yeah there's some things that are like wow that's actually just impressive like on its own uh my my experience of it is um yeah and no, i think I think sometimes when you maybe are at an interview or even maybe you get the job, you know, sometimes it's sort of like, are you kind of, you know, there to full quotas, you know, do you mean as in like people are kind of like, oh, okay, you're new, you know, or like, you know, you're on your probation period, do you mean as in, so there's always sometimes an element of, you know, you feel the need to prove yourself, you know, um, yeah. 
but I wouldn't necessarily say yeah so I think I think that's sort of what it is sometimes you know um and so that's kind of been my experience of it um and, and it's just maybe sometimes just you know a comment here made here or there that you know will make you feel uncomfortable because you're like why why did that person think that or say that you know yeah. um yeah. but yeah I think in general for me at least for me personally I mean I just love what I study and love what I do so I you know I try not to get offended and you know I kind of I'm just I'm just here to study and like I love planes and you know Formula One cars. I mean that's why I got into it. You know, so it's kind of like yeah, yeah I just think it's cool. You know, so yeah. so if you think it's cool as well, then then we have something in common. Yeah, uh, Johannes, uh, what would you add or what has been your experience? Yeah, I mean, well, add on unconscious bias. I think it's a it's an interesting term, and I think we could we can if we move to the unconscious part, we just talk about bias to some extent because I think as, as Tafar explained, there is that sort of it's being done unconsciously, but I think sometimes actually when you actually compare unconscious bias to conscious bias, quite often the effects are the same. And so we should we should be very clear about that. But at the same time, we should also be quite honest and say, majority, there's very few people on this planet who do not have biases about something or for yeah. some reason. I mean, and, and some of these can be positive, for example, there is this stereotype of the efficient German, which works quite well within engineering and things like this, of being an efficient German. But there's also great examples of German inefficiency as well, but the stereotype doesn't really pick up on that and so when we, and, and sometimes and some of us will have those biases and we won't necessarily um realize that we have those biases and that's what the unconscious bias part is about that we don't necessarily even realize that we have them whether they be them positive or negative because they will have an effect on how we choose something so if we do go around thinking for example germans are great industrial and, and efficient type of people you know and then we see someone called johannes who applies for a job and that might work in my favor because people might think i'm german in fact this happened before and then i get there I'm not German, <laughs> and, and the reaction changes quite quickly, and and, and the, the the situation changes quite quickly, and, and so I think um, the first thing to tackle in unconscious bias is accepting that majority of people, regardless of who you are, will have a bias of some kind, and it's about educating yourself and being aware of that. There's se several different programs within the workplace now that actually you could do tests and you can figure out what your biases are, and you might be surprised by them. You might end up seeing that you're actually I see I know quite a lot of people who take it, and they say. Actually, I'm biased against myself, you know, I'm a white man, I'm biased against other white men, or I'm a black man, I'm biased against other black men, or a black man, I'm biased against black women, etc. And they don't realize it because they're very slight subtleties in terms of the way yeah. in which you react to how people are in certain positions, as, as the, my two um, co-panelists have already explained. And I think it is, it is upon all of us to actually do that education of self, to have that knowledge of ourselves and know actually, it's not, it doesn't make us necessarily a bad person, because that's, that's the idea, right? If you're biased, Therefore, you're a bad person. We're not necessarily a bad person. You just have grown up with certain perceptions or ideas about how things are, and you need to challenge yourself on that. And 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 that's what I would say about unconscious bias. I think I, I would be here all day off yeah. if I start talking about my experience yeah. of unconscious yeah, yeah. bias. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's uh, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Me. Yeah. Uh, I've got a lot to um, to talk about as well, basically, when it comes to. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, ask the panel is basically, do you think it's possible that organizations, especially um, like in particular in the in the in particular in the aviation aerospace um, industry, are not um, actively searching or seeking out un underrepresented um, candidates? Basically, do you think that uh, that might potentially be a, a an issue? Have you seen that? Um, um, do you think that's uh, that's uh, that's a problem? Uh, um, maybe let's start with Tafara. And... Okay. Um. So mm, there's two parts to it. I mean, it's. Um, I think to some extent, perhaps seeking out candidates, you know, from you know, I think matter isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, or at least maybe looking at outreach type programs. And I say this because I benefited from one of those when I was still in high school. Um, and so, I mean, I went to a, a state school and I was sort of really interested in engineering and there was a um, there was an organization called the Southern Trust. I'm not sure whether they still exist, but then they were running physics um, summer schools at Cambridge, right? And they were yeah. targeting certain regions, right? For like, you know, kids would have potential in, in physics to sort of say, hey, you know, do you think you could study at Cambridge? 
So, you know, kind of through the school, I applied and I got in. And so I actually did a physics summer school at Cambridge and really enjoyed it. Um, I also did the maths at one at LSE. Again, it was through a similar program um, and one at City University London. So, and then through those experiences, I decided, oh, I actually I really like engineering, but I actually I want to do it at Cambridge. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have, you know, programs that do target, you know, underrepresented like communities, kind of like the Hamilton yep. Commission. I don't yep. know too much of it. But I think you have to be careful when it actually now comes to, you know, putting your application in, you know, interview and, and then selection, right? Because I still had to, you know, and apply like everyone else, you know, write a personal statement, you know, get the right grades and that sort of stuff. So I think, you know, it's that needs to be sort of bore in mind, you know, and to what extent you start that process, I'm not entirely sure. But I do think if you're saying you want to increase diversity and inclusion, then yes, look at the gaps there. And what type of you know programs that you can have such that it's a sort of um, you know you get channels you know that allow people to to reach the sector. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Jackson, I really wanted to make sure that you um, have the opportunity to really just go into a little bit more detail in terms of what you do, what you guys are um, like, the various initiatives that are out there, so that people can really just um, uh, look into those and and be informed about. Um, uh, what's out there in terms of help, in terms of mentoring, in terms of uh, um, uh, support for uh, yeah underrepresented um, uh, candidates or individuals? Uh, Jackson, I think you're muted. You like me to go into that now? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, can so, hear you. Yeah, it'd I'd be really good if you could. Uh, yeah. I don't think um, ring fencing certain opportunities for diverse groups is a bad thing at all. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, I actually get this question a lot because the program that I run is for black, Asian and minority ethnic young people and for young females um, between the ages of 13 and 25. Um, you are able, so it's one thing, it's something that a lot of organizations do, the BBC, um the netflix um different aviation organizations um you're able to to ring fence certain opportunity for um, underrepresented groups and protected characteristic groups because of the fact that it's, it's leveling up so it's not to exclude anyone from any opportunities it's to ensure that everyone has um access to representation and that if there's an area that an organization is lacking in they now start to focus on making sure that um, they're paying attention to the diversity and things like that. So what we do is we run, um, coming back to your question, sorry, uh, we run an, um, a program which gives young people a critical understanding of how to get into the aviation industry and how to become um, commercial airline pilots. They have to be between the ages of 13 and 25. Um, yeah. And what that means is there's lots of different sessions um, we take an in-depth look into being a commercial pilot, being an engineer, um, air traffic controller, all different aspects of aviation. Um, and at the end of the program, we give away a number of trial flights and a number of private pilot licenses for young people. So since we've been running, we've partnered with British Airways, um, Virgin Atlantic, um, Nats, the um, Flight Training Academy Global, um, and the World Championship Air Races. There's other airlines that want to um, join us as partners of the organization and that's because of the impact that it's having um, for young people so one of the most important things about the program is to show from diverse backgrounds that this is an opportunity that they can access these are careers um, that they can access um, and yeah that, that that that's what I do um, that's the opportunities so we, we have um, some of our young people go on to do work experience and internships like with people like yep. British Airways. Um, they also go on to get apprenticeships uh, with some of the organizations we work with and it's continuous mentoring. Um, and I think that it, it's, it's, it's very important to do this um, if there's underrepresentation in an industry um, to create opportunities to increase the representation. So it's not about excluding anyone, it's about including everybody. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I that's what I do. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for um, for explaining. Um, Johannes, uh, would you add anything um, to, uh, uh, to this? Or uh, I mean, yeah, to the topic of what else can organizations do to actively reach um, underrepresented candidates, groups? Um, yeah, what what uh, what can they um, do that they're not necessarily doing today? Yeah, I would say for recruitment, recruiters and uh, and people working within that area to, um, to recruit people into into aer uh, aerospace and aviation, I'd say. There's organizations out there that sort of that represent sort of like BB STEM, for example, and AFBE represent sort of groups of AFBE is the Association for Black and Ethnic um, Minority Ethnic Engineers. BB STEM is for um, black black people in STEM. So so there's different organizations already, and I'd say if you're not connected to those as a recruiter or an organization connected to those, because they will have group, um, huge lists of, of of people who are actively working in engineering and looking for work within engineering as well. Um, and I would say just look at, first of all, before you start thinking about diversity, think about your own internal practices. Is your organization an inclusive place to work already? And then think about where you're going out to, to do your recruitment. Quite often, what we, we found within sort of the research we've done is engineering companies like to prioritize certain universities, universities with high representation, reputations or, or universities um, that are Russell Group or universities that are well known for specific engineering courses, et cetera, which of course makes sense. But that's not necessarily where you're always going to find ethnic minority um, candidates, and those candidates are not necessarily always going to have the diverse talent that you're looking for as a company and organization. So it's worth looking further afield, find out where the university that, that you'll find that, that talent at it is, and going and recruiting from those as well, and not sort of having these sort of cross recruitment strategies where you cut people off based on what university they, they attended. I think those are some of the basic things. Yeah. Yeah, that leads us very nicely to the next um, area that I wanted to um, to cover or go into some detail around is how can we ensure that really the um, the the recruitment process, the selection process at all seniority levels, whether it's um, uh, um, young professionals, mid career, and and senior level people, how can we ensure that the there is diversity, there is um, there is um, inclusivity in the, at the recruitment uh, stage. Uh, basically, maybe, maybe I'll start by just sharing a few uh, things that I'm seeing in practice. Um, maybe that would um, help um, um, the audience. I think it's one of the issues I'm seeing is this employee referral um, thing, which is basically um, some companies are intentionally trying to avoid uh, hiring people of color by basically um, 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 asking uh, whoever works there basically who do you know and of course i mean who who are you going to know if you're a white person if you're a white british person then it, it, it's going to be other white british people who you went to university or schools with. so i think this employer referral schemes um that's a major drawback basically when you're relying on the on the social network of non-diverse stuff basically i mean it's basically that's the quickest way to homogenize uh, an organization i think that would be one thing that i would um, highlight and also if you're not how can you appeal to a diverse talent without a diverse staff i mean uh, candidates are very savvy these days i mean they do their research <laughs> very thoroughly and by that I don't mean that they check out your careers website. They pick up the phone, they have a look on LinkedIn, they reach out to people who are already working there. And some of the savviest people reach out to people who are no longer at the organization and ask them, why? Why did you move on? So basically, um, when you're attracting talent, you you really need to make sure that they have the confidence that they will belong um, that, and, and they will just not be able to contribute or have an impact um uh, or flourish or and build a career if they um uh, if they are not seeing that others um who are coming from the same sort of uh, ethnicity or color whatever it is um have succeeded basically so those those are the things that i would and and this leads to internal isolation i speak to quite a lot of people that basically because of this homogeneous stuff um, yeah, it's basically they just can't and they don't uh, belong, basically. So that's why having these voluntary groups, employee-led groups for non-white people, LGBT people, uh, uh, employees, and just providing these networking opportunities within an organization would be a really good first step, I think, uh, in aviation, where I'm not really seeing 
uh, these things uh, on a regular basis, basically, especially with those airlines, airports, things like that. So um, that's my uh, take on it. Um, maybe, um, Tabara, if you would like to go first, and then um, uh, Jackson, and then Jonas. Um, okay. Um, yes, I mean, I think um, I think you and Alice made an interesting point or a very good point earlier about um, you know ensuring that your workforce is inclusive. You know, um, because if people don't feel uh, not even necessarily acceptable, but even comfortable, you know, then you know it's unlikely that they'll stay for long or, or, or whatever it is. I mean, you you just want. Or, in theory, all your employees to be happy, you know, there'll, there'll be no reason to leave, you know, unless there's other, yeah. you know, um, situations. One one thing I'd say is sort of, yes, I mean, I think so. So for me personally, I'd say, yes, like being inclusive, I, like for me, I'm just really interested in aerospace and in aviation and at university, although that's what I studied, but because I had other interests, I had a lot of friends who did other things, whether they were lawyers, whether they were um, I don't know, English major students or English, and I always found it interesting to actually talk to them, right? Um, because I always got a different opinion or diversity, or I'd be telling them about this project that I'm doing or the masters and that sort of stuff. So if you can, um, you know, create a situation where it is diverse, whether it's from whoever's personal background, that's actually, you can still focus on like the task or the job that you're doing and love it, right? Then that's really what you have to aim for. Um, and so if perhaps, you know, in your recruitment for aviation en engineers, you know, there's just a particular dominant stereotype, right, that ends up being successful. It just means that anyone else who doesn't quite fit into that, you know, will find it challenging, yeah. right? So, um, and I think, like I said, like, I think, I think, I think it was uh, Johannes who said, it, like, quite interesting that 25% of uh, people study, you know, aviation or aer aerospace uh, are actually from ethnic minorities, whereas there's about maybe 7% that actually then end up in, or 9% that end up in the workforce. So yeah, there's probably a reason for that, right? So it's kind of, you know, to some extent you could say at the university level, there's actually quite a high recruitment. So why is it that then, you know, when you start to work for jobs, like maybe going into industry, there's a lower rate, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a bit of a, a, a rounded thing, but I think it's, and I don't quite have an answer for that, but I think definitely trying to ensure or working on making sure that your workplace is inclusive is very key. Yep. Um, yeah. Because if you do uh, that, you then the diversity will follow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah Johannes, would you, would you like to um, um, add anything to that? The... Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think I, I, I think I agree with everything that Sarah just, just said. I think. Um, when we're looking at sort of, uh, sort of like the issues, like I was saying earlier, um, you have to look multifaceted at, at the recruitment process and and, and sort of making sure it, there's inclusivity embedded embedded at all areas of your organisation, especially that recruitment process. Um, and I think one of the key areas is around the recruitment panel. First of all, the sifting panel who look at the CVs and the applications that come in. Um, who's sitting on that panel? Do you have that a diverse pool yep. of people already? Then they're reviewing those applications and seeing what's happening. Is your criteria that they're reviewing against fair? Is it based on specifically the job or is it based on what some organizations do? Like I said, we all have biases and quite often the, the number one bias that most people have is they like people who are like them. They want to work with people who are similar. Point is, you're not hiring a friend, you're hiring someone to do the job. So yeah. your, your, your job, <laughs> everything on the, on the job application should be about the, the role itself um, and adding extra things which are going to be about personality or ways of working may may have some relevance, but in many ways, some of those things end up cutting people out because you're trying to force it down a, a, a pathway and where people work like how you work. And many people might not want to do that. And so I think um, making sure that those things are clear. And then finally, once you get to that stage of actually having interviews, again, making sure that the people who are interviewing are, is a diverse panel of people um, who, again, not just diverse in looks and appearance, but diverse in a, in a thoughts and what they bring to a company and organization as well. And, and wherever possible, never have a one person sort of panel make the decision on their own. Exactly. And include more than one person, basically, and then have include people from different levels of authority, mix of genders, ethnicities, basically, so that you have really like a, a mixed um, panel. Yeah, completely, uh, completely. I mean, it's very often overlooked um, because, yeah, it just helps address the 
this whole unconscious bias thing that we've um, we've been talking about. Um, Jackson, um, would you add anything to um, um, to this? Yeah, I just I just think it's about just um, inclusive thinking. I think um, you may the recruitment processes before may have um, asked very specific questions and looked for one specific type of answer to fit the mold. So when you hear one answer, you think, okay, you know what, this is this is exactly what we wanted to hear. But every time you hear um, that particular answer, you end up hiring the same people. So I think open yourself up to different um, types of thinking um, from different types of think um, that types of background background. Um, read through people's CVs um, and also their cover letters a bit more thoroughly um, because I know a lot of um, organizations recruit by scanning um, CVs and cover letters for specific words, specific schools, um, specific um, educational backgrounds. Um, but there are people, um, and I'm not just talking about ethnic diversity now, I'm talking about everyone. There are people that have the ability to do the role and are so capable, um, but they may not have gone to um, Oxford or Cambridge University. They may not have gone to Warwick. Um, they may not have gone to Brunel. They may have done an open university course. Um, yeah. There are people that, um, it's like the, the big banks at the moment, JP Morgan, um, Citibank, and there's a lot of law firms as well. Um, what they're saying now is that they're not, they're opening up their hiring process to not just um, people that go through the university route, but also people who want to go through the apprentice route or, or people that want to jump in and, and, and train. Do you get what I mean? Because yeah. just going through university doesn't mean that um, you're more capable than um, someone who hasn't gone to university. You could have gone to university, but someone who didn't go to university could also have been studying um, and upskilling themselves while getting practical in the industry um, experience. And does that mean that because they've been getting in the industry experience, um, that when you're skimming their CV and you see that they haven't gone to university, that you should automatically exclude them? So I think it's about opening up the criteria for candidates um, a bit wider, um, listening to what people have to say a bit more and not looking for specific things, but hearing people's passion but, and also um, their capabilities, which they might explain in a different way, um, and just opening up the hiring process to being more inclusive of all. Don't have the same people hiring people um, where it's just um, the yeah. management where it's just the management sitting across the table, looking at someone, asking them questions. Like I like that person. I like how um, I like how how much that person sounds like they're following instructions, or I sound like like how much that person seems to fit yep. within the company values. Um, but invite members of staff, um, people that are in the role, um, people that are shadowing the role, people that um, other people from the organisation to come in and listen to an interview. Um, look at hiring people that may not fit in your company's culture, but may bring something um, something interesting um, to your organization, but they're also capable. I think it's just opening your mind. Um, I think we just need to, um, the recruitment process just um, needs to be a bit more open um, rather than rigid, because obviously the recruitment process for a number of years has been very, um, these are the people that get this job in every industry. Um, I like the fact that um, organisations are pushing to make things a lot more diverse now. Uh, whether that's ethnic, um, ethnicity, um, age, wise, um, sexual orientation, whatever it is, um, it's about opening up your mind and hearing what people have to say, um, rather than just making an assumption um, or scanning people out. Yeah. No, definitely. And the other two things that came to mind is basically thinking about the questions that you ask candidates very carefully and also very carefully thinking about the job description as well, because the language you use, even unknowingly, you can discourage people from applying, basically, if you if you say things that, uh, yeah, that have been carelessly put together. I think a lot of hiring managers that just don't spend enough time um, uh, thinking about the specification, basically. Yeah, I was going through the um, I was going through a few applications that's coming from um, this year's participants for um, some pilots licenses that I'm giving away, 
Um, yeah. And they're, they're written very differently. So, so some young people write their applications very differently. But one young person may have gone through Brunel University and one young person may have gone through an apprenticeship. So because um, this person who's gone through university is able to talk about everything that they've learned in university in depth, doesn't mean that the person that's gone through the apprenticeship, even though they're talking about it through a different angle, talking about their actual experience in industry, doesn't mean that they, they, they should be discounted. It's like when you receive an application from a younger person versus an older person, um, sometimes the language is going to be different, sometimes the experience is going to be different, um, but they both may have the same capability. And if they don't, the younger person, the younger person could be more eager to learn, the older person could be more eager to learn. You get what I mean? It's just about yeah. challenging, challenging that everybody has to answer to things the exact same way and think about, okay, you know, let me just listen to the different things that they're saying and what fits best with what we're looking for um, and who um, is actually going to be an asset to this company, whether it means us having to adapt um, to the way that they are or them adapting to the way that we are, um, who's actually going to be an asset rather than who's just going to comply with everything we're saying to them um, and fall in line with the way of thinking um, here so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another issue um, I wanted to um, discuss with you, with the panel, is basically the various barriers um, that exist when it comes to career progression. So once you're in an organization, you got hired, um, but um, what I'm talking about is basically promotion, um, being viewed as one of those uh, favored uh, ones with, within the organization. Um, would be really good to um, hear from your um, experience, like individual experience as well, own experience as well. Uh, once you got through the selection process, um, did you see any unfair discrimination basically when it comes to getting a better role, getting a promotion, getting a um, a chance to travel somewhere or like like uh, anything that you can uh, think and and most importantly, how can those barriers uh, to career progression be um, overcome basically what are some of the strategies that uh, you've seen work or you you've you used um, in your own sort of life and and um, um, career um, the Farah, if you would like to start with uh, with that okay um barriers okay um i think one's already been mentioned which is just i suppose education you know whether you've taken the university route or apprenticeship you know so i think that needs to be bore in mind so because yeah you know it's quite likely that those two people will speak differently they might even be expressing the same idea but they just approach it from different angles so i think that needs to be accounted for and that's very much true once you start working in industry um uh, okay other barriers okay and i think once you're actually so one one thing i'd say is maybe to some extent, once you're actually in the show and in the workplace is to focus on like, first of all, like the actual job or the role that you're meant to be doing. Right. So, for example, um, I'll give you an example. So when I was working at Rolls Royce, the first team I worked in was the installation zero team. Um, and that happened to be the main team I worked with when I was doing my PhD, um, like on the academic side. So with some of them, I knew them by name, but I also knew a lot about intake. So, you know, if you'd asked me to do a particular task, right also like on the the rig that was developed in cambridge it would take me far less time to do it because i you know i was quite instrumental in designing it right whereas if you ask someone else to do it they might be more experienced than me and better but they might even take longer just because they're not as familiar but similarly if you ask maybe a grad student to to do a task you know um they might then approach it from a completely different angle right because you know they're sort of coming from a different perspective so I think you, you then start to see, um, I think ultimately in, it comes down to um, what the, not, not what the job is, but what the purpose of the company is. So if the purpose of the company is training, you know, pilots, it's like, okay, that's the main thing. You know, what are the barriers? What is stopping someone from, um, you know, getting to the next level? You know, is it, I don't know, is it age? Is it family commitments? Is it whatever it is? So I think that to some extent there is a case by case basis, but, um, you know, I think you have to still 
know the role that you're doing and perhaps the next place you want to go and why, for yeah. example. So, because I know let's say with people with families, they would not necessarily want a role that requires too much traveling. You know, let's say yeah. you have kids and you want to, you know, drop them off at school. So even though like they might be like on paper very much the perfect candidate for that, you know, but they might not be keen for it for that reason. You know, so it's not really even related to their performance of work or an inability to do that. It's a personal choice. So I think it's, you know, sometimes it's, you know, to look at those factors also. Um, yeah. yeah, it would be useful. Yeah. <laughs> Jackson, do you have anything to yeah, yeah, because I have to. Um, I actually have to jump off. Yeah, a yeah. Bit early. Of course, of course. I have to add to that. Um, I think that the barriers for progression um, in um, in terms of diversity um, is a lot of organisations are very happy um, to call themselves diverse when most of their diversity sits on bottom level. Um, so I noticed that a lot of organisations that have um, I hope I'm answering the right question. I thought, I think I am, but please tell me if I'm not. Um, I noticed that a lot of organizations will say that 45% um, or 46% of their workforce are from diverse backgrounds. Um, and all that diversity will sit on bottom level, um, maybe a few in middle level, but none, none really on decision-making level. So if you ask a lot of organizations, let's say you ask, um, a major organization about their diversity, they'll show you that a lot of their customer um, service assistants or um, yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, yeah. entry-level positions um, have diversity. But then if you ask them what their diversity is like on director level or decision-making level, you notice it's, it's not even one or two percent. Like it's very, it, 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 it's very, very low. Um, so I think it's about challenging that, that thinking of being happy, um, bringing people into your organization for the sake of calling yourself diverse and not allowing them opportunities to actually progress. Um, actually look at the staff, what they're doing, their capabilities and who should be, and it's not about giving someone an opportunity over the other, um, but start challenging why are we always promoting this one group of people um, and there's a lot of talent in this group of people, start making it more open. And then also a lot of promotion opportunities um, comes from the back of um, who does your who does the management like the most like who can they um, who can they they vibe with the most um, who who do they lean on the most in terms of they may not provide opportunities to lean on other members of staff um, but who can they, um, they lean on who can they go out and socialize with the most whereas the promotions and opportunities in that sense should be more open so that they're for everyone rather than one person um, yeah. in the decision. It should be a diverse panel of people making the decision like, okay, you know what, actually, um, um, Zeke, um, Zeke really did really well on that project last month and he took the lead. Um, he improved the, uh, the efficiency of the, the jet engine, the inlets, um, and he produced the, he improved the efficiency of the gas turbine. He took the lead on this project. Um, or he, he's done this or he's done that, or she has um, really optimized the way that we think about fuel efficiency. So she should be the one um, who we're looking at promoting now, um, rather than, you know what, um, Roger, Roger's been here quite a while. He's a sound guy. I think we need to make him manager or, or, or Sarah's been here a long time. She's, she's, she's a sound girl. We should, we should make her the manager. It needs to be on ability and also it needs to be inclusive of everyone rather than who you know and also we need to start removing that comfortability of um being proud of ourselves um or organizations being proud of themselves um, when their diversity sits on lower level because i guarantee if you ask some of the top organizations um how diverse you are they will tell you how 30 40 percent of their staff are from these backgrounds and um, this many staff are women and then you ask okay how many of your directors of your organization or senior managers are, are, are diverse? And they'll be like, mm, we're working on improving that. Um, currently, it's like seven, eight percent, you know what I mean? And then you start to yeah. yeah, I think, I think that's it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's um, thank you for, for sharing. And if you need to go, uh, Jackson, um, um, maybe now would be. I'd really like to answer before I leave. <laughs> 
Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Johannes, if you would like to add anything and talk about your experiences in terms of the, the barriers, challenges, obstacles that you faced once you were within an organization, basically, and did you ever feel any kind of disadvantaged sort of, um, uh, yeah. did you find yourself in a disadvantaged position? What did you do about it? What can be other people do about it, basically, when it comes to progression, when it comes to really getting from A to B within an organization, basically, once you're in? Yeah, that that can be quite uh, um, tough. I suppose first of all, I would say about so sort of what what we could do to address some of the barriers. And I think the first yeah. things first is, as engineering organized as engineers in general, like it is about numbers. And engineers generally like numbers, from my understanding. I'm not an engineer by background, by the way, but um, I, I, from my understanding, engineers generally like numbers. So I, I'm generally quite good with numbers. But when it comes to the issue of diversity and inclusion, the numbers tend to go missing. Um, and really, it's what you don't if you don't measure, you can't manage. And what, me and what you measure, are what you will be able to match, you know, and what you measure matters. And so it's not just about looking at the diversity of the people coming into your, into your company, it's also about tracking that data yeah. up it, on every single level um, and, and understanding where, why and when people start dropping off and then actively doing something about that once you notice that data. So it's actually constantly taking data and constantly reviewing that data so you know where the issues are. And that's just one of the very easy things and the first things organizations should be looking to do is getting a good hold of their data and diversity data of their, of, their, of their staff. And if staff are not giving up their diversity data, the company should already be asking themselves questions about their inclusive culture. Why is it that our staff don't feel or don't trust us with that data? That's a big yeah. question that you need to ask yourself as a company. Um, my own experiences, I suppose, with barriers, uh, I, 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 they've been various, I suppose, in different areas. I think coming in to, to, from an internship in the first place, I think I struggled. I struggled to get an internship. Once getting them, I struggled to get out of internships. It's like everybody just wanted to yeah. hire me as an intern. Nobody wanted to hire me for anything um, beyond that. And so you, I'm not saying that companies longer than perhaps you might normally do because you're trying to take a step up first before you move on because otherwise you're just going to have to do an internship again. Um, the, the issues around that were, one, there was issues with my, my, my own sort of abilities and skills. So I had gone to, similar to what Tavaran Jackson has said, I had gone to a sort of university in an area where I didn't necessarily receive all that employability um, education alongside the degree I was doing. I'd done a degree, I was very good at that. But in terms of how do you write a CV and a cover letter for um, not for a job in, in you know, retail, Nobody was going to teach me that. I had to learn all of that myself. And in fact, in my first job, I, I found out six months into it, my first proper internship that was, six months into it, I found out actually that my name was ended up in the rejection pile. And I was one of the staff members who had recently done a DNI course, who had gone through the rejection pile, saw my CV and said, actually, this person had ticks all the boxes. They just haven't put it down in the way that we, um, we, we, we expect people to put it down. And so yeah. she, they gave me an opportunity. I sh shone at the interview and I was able to um, go on from there. So the, the question is, one, I probably would have never had the opportunity if she didn't do that. And two, how do, do we take that into account that people aren't necessarily taught how to write a CV or, or, or a cover letter um, when, when we do this, these, um, uh, uh, these applications, especially for the opening level? And then once people come in, are we do, giving them that continued career um, um, development to make sure that they are ready to take the step up? Because the question is, if you have ethnic minority um, staff at your workplace who stay in the same level for many years, and you're not asking questions about why they haven't been able to make um, the move up. You're probably failing to, to, to in your duty in terms of career, professional career development to your staff as well. Exactly. Want, exactly. Want, completely agree with that. One thing before, yeah. I, before I jump off, I knew a man who um, was in a role for about 40 years, 45 years, yeah? And he had never got a promotion past um, lower level, yeah? So he was skilled, he, he was skilled in engineering, he was skilled in um, asset management, he was skilled in everything, yeah? But he had never, he was a black man, never got um, promoted past, past um, lower level. Um, and all his colleagues, so like, not all his colleagues, but I'd say um, the colleagues that would come in, um, the colleagues that weren't from a, a, a diverse background would always get the promotions, like they'd always go on the work drinks, um, they'd always get a promotion. Um, they would always they formed those inner clicks but when it came down to doing anything like when it came down to assessing um different solutions and um optimizing things they'd come to him and say oh how would how, how do you do this or how do you do it so they'd ask him how to do everything 
without giving him the the promotion, which showed that he was very capable. But they just weren't, and and it made him very uninspired about the organization. So like in terms of he didn't really, uh, he got to a point where he didn't feel appreciated in the organization yeah. when he left. And when he left, they realized there were so many things that people couldn't do now that he had left. Um, so they should have promoted him ages ago and they tried to bring him back. Um, and he was like, no, I've been in your organization how four years. Um, I'm not coming back because you should have appreciated me while I was there. So it's just, you don't want to lose talent by just not being um, open and inclusive. And with that note, I've got to head off. So thank yep. you very much. Yeah. No, thank you very much for, for the insights and, and uh, for your time, uh, Jackson, a lot. Thank you. What I would like to do is basically just conscious of time um, as well. Wanted to really just uh, open up the um, floor to the uh, to the audience for any uh, questions. Uh, would be really good to just um, uh, um, hear um, uh, some feedback as well. Uh, it has been uh, helpful. But if you if you have any specific um, issues, questions, queries that you would like to address, uh, please um, do so. Would be uh, would be great. Hello. Hello. Yes, I can say. Suppose by uh, I, I don't have any questions myself. Uh, I suppose I wait for for a few. I think um, I suppose I could share my own experiences in the past. Suppose I haven't had. I would say I haven't had necessarily bad experiences of of um, um, job interviews and assessments. Other than oh yeah, only only one actually, uh, which I spoke about a bit earlier. Of actually, it, it's similar to name. So my name, Johanna Scarlett. Um, my spelling and, and my name comes from actually Ethiopian name, but it, it, it appears across many different um, cultures. And, and people used to see my name on job applications and assume that, of course, I was from yeah. Scandinavian country or from Germany, et cetera. And you would get quite warm and happy um, replies to your application. Um, one, one thing I remember actually, they, they called me up and told me how their, one of their best friends is called Johannes and it's such a coincidence and looking forward to meeting me. And then when I arrived, of course, I wasn't who they was expecting. Um, I, I did not look like their German best friend, um, Johannes. And they, and they and you could see the visible disappointment on their face. And the rest of the um, interview was quite um, it's quite awkward after that point, I think. And, and I think actually that, that, that's another one of those things in terms of the barriers and making sure recruitment as a recruiter, you try to stay as as very um, either very friendly or just be very blank. You know, <laughs> I think there's only two ways to really go by it. But if you are going to change in the middle of your interview, it's going to give off an uh, uh, indication to to the people you're you're hiring that maybe you're they're not wanted. And it's going to, they're not necessarily going to be able to promote their perform their best. So I would advise most recruiters to always just be friendly and encouraging, even if you know this person has no chance in getting a job, even if the answer they're giving you is bad. Just continue to be friendly and encouraging. Because that is going to give them the best chance to show their best self, um, and and then when you give them the feedback, you could actually say, you know what, you was good, you was good in these areas, you weren't so good in this area. Um, but I don't think immediate feedback is never good in an interview. So I, I just say that for recruiters. Exactly, I think feedback is something that organizations don't tend to give, especially to um, uh, like the big, like the Airbuses, the Boeings of the world, basically, there because they simply don't really have the time to um, to get back to every single one of the candidates that applied. Basically, they are uh, focusing on the successful ones. I mean, you can say that it's unfair and all that because you never hear back. You don't know what you did well. You don't know what you hear uh, you, what you did um, badly. But um, you can also, especially now, um, Johannes and, and Tafara, I think it's basically where there are so many people looking, actively looking at all different levels. Um, that's why a lot of organizations don't advertise. That's why uh, you really need to tap into the into the hidden job market. That's why uh, this whole employee referral thing is basically, it's quite ripe at the moment because it's basically the, a, a recruitment effort starts by who do you know? Do you know anyone? Can we can we talk to him and the, and her or her? Uh, like, and and of course, that's very counterproductive to everything that we talked about, basically, because it, you, the person that you know will probably be your cousin, 
who is who went to Cambridge University basically or or wherever. So basically, that's the yeah. that's the yeah. You know, I, I I do agree with that actually. Sort of, you know, employee referrals. I'm sort of a bit a bit touchy about that because um, to some extent, I think it, the system should be that anyone has equal chance. You know, because if you ask me to to recommend a few aerospace engineers, I'm pretty sure I could do that, right? Just because I yeah. studied with quite a few. Um, and so really there's bias in that. Um, you know, what I always sort of say to people when they ask for advice, I'd say, you know, just go for the interview and, you know, make sure you read the job description, right? And to just show them yeah. your best self, right? Yeah. Don't worry too much about, oh, they'll think, you know, I'm this or that, you know, as in you're recruiting for that, you know, you've applied for that role, right? You know, you've been invited for an interview, right? So um, just show them what your potential is, right? And, and don't worry about, what the competition is doing, like how many people have applied, how many people haven't applied, or oh, they're probably taking it. I mean, that's not your decision. Your decision is to turn up, right? To have done your homework and research and just to do your best. Yeah. Um, and I also just think that, you know, sometimes if you do actually do your research, right? Let's say you're thinking about, because I wouldn't say I, I grew up thinking I want to be an engineer. I wouldn't even have known what that meant, yeah. right? But it's more like, oh, I like, you know, being quite active, quite hands on. And then you kind of speak, oh, you know, like, you know, what we'll do. Oh, maybe, you know, maybe this, maybe that. Right. And then you start to, yeah, do some research, ask people, you know, so that, you know, when you sort of decide, oh, actually, I want to study medical sciences. Right. Then, you know, you're sort of an informed decision. And now you're also putting in the work. Right. Um, and so I think it's. You know, and I'm, I'm really kind of maybe saying this more from an applicant point of view. Um, and even I think for me personally, I think I was a little bit lucky in the sense that because um, I moved here when I was about 10, 11. And so yeah. the first school I went to is the one I stayed with. And at the time, it wasn't a great school. But then I settled in, you know, and, you know, didn't really see a reason to leave because I was happy, you know. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, once you approach, you know, 15, 16, I was like, oh, you know, you know, I knew I wanted to go to university. Other people didn't. They wanted to take the apprenticeship route. That was fine, you know. And so I was yeah. there for, say, eight years, which is a huge chunk of time. And so to some extent, you know, each year I went like, you know, year seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, there was less and less bias because people knew me, whether it was the teachers, the students. I mean, I did stuff in the local community. Um, and even Cambridge, I mean, I entered when I was 18, right? So like I said, the recruitment yeah. process is quite like you know rigid but like once i was there it's not like my direct societies didn't know who i was right you know she was one of the people who interviewed me and um and yeah and i stayed there for eight years so you know with some of the things i applied to i to some extent i even had forgot to see any bias if that makes sense because you know it's sort of like oh it'll be interesting to study mit you know i'll apply you know i was unsuccessful yeah. but i still applied you know and i didn't really necessarily think i didn't get it because of xyz it's just you know i didn't get it you know yeah. um and even in working for roles like i said i did my phd with them so you know i already knew some of the team i already knew a lot about the company you know having you know have done a phd with them that's probably the so best not, way to um to have a look around that yeah, yeah do you know what i mean it's just like it's just so you know yeah, yeah. um so it, and it's not as though like i've ever i don't think i've ever actually referred anyone in terms of employee referral you know yeah. like not yeah. not to be mean or anything it's just like i just like just go on the website you know or you know doing just 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 you know, do it yourself Equal you know, like, opportunity, basically. yeah do you know what i mean it's just like you know i just don't want to be a bit of a hypocrite you know just be like oh so yeah but, exactly but i mean you say, shouldn't I have I work with someone i i like no there's, there's loads of people i've worked with who i i mean you know in my head i would recommend them you know and it's just you know yeah giving everyone a, like a fair and equal chance yeah exactly yeah. exactly and you shouldn't be treated any different just because someone uh, within the organization recommended you. I mean, you can, yeah, yes. I've seen a lot of uh, failures who came in because they knew someone. And then when it comes to the day to day job, they were just not good enough, basically. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, yeah. And they were preferred exactly. throughout the entire process, basically, because Jane recommended him. <laughs> so it's basically that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think there is. So, so the reason why a lot of people are doing this referral, like you say, is is about cost, cutting costs, right? It's a lot cheaper and quicker if you no, can just get somebody in. And and the point is, like you say, when you get somebody in who's not good for the job, there's a huge cost for that. And actually, what people, what, what companies need to think about is actually strategically, it's not beneficial in the long run actually to to recruit in this way actually. And in the long run, what you end up with is people. And I know of situations where this is happening at organisations where someone has come in because of 
somebody else who knew them. They brought them on. They weren't good at the job, but they had gone past probation. And they wanted to get rid of yeah. them, but they couldn't. And so you're, you're stuck with this this person who's not necessarily good for the role for, for a long period of time, costing you. And you have to go to hire somebody else to actually do that person's job because that person isn't actually able to do it properly. And so as an organization, it makes sense um, just to do it right in the first place. And and I think that if you are a company that has grown to that level where you are that popular and your roles are that popular, you're getting a lot of applications in, it's worth investing in, in, in some HR staff. It's worth investing in some recruitment staff who could handle that for you and to help you as an organization. Because in the long run, you're going to get somebody who comes in and actually sits in your organization, adds value, and isn't going to be a drain. For the, for the, for the long exactly, term. especially at senior level, that's what we do. Uh, we uh, get instructed by organization who need a, a director level, VP level, C level individual, someone on the board of the organization. And that's, um, um, yeah, I mean, you don't post those things on LinkedIn, basically. I mean, if you would do that, if you would go about that uh, like that, then our job uh, wouldn't exist, basically. So it's, it's, it's just. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there is an added value when it comes to a recruiting, like employing recruit, like uh, qualified, uh, good quality recruiters out there who really know the market, who can screen the candidates, who really know where to look beyond the beyond the Cranfield universities, beyond the the um, uh, um, the Coventries and 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 all the other sort of. Um, um, when or the Embry Riddles in the U.S. I mean, it, it's. Um, um yeah i think it's uh, that's the whole that's the added value to employ someone who really uh goes the extra mile and makes sure that basically uh they just you don't get just a recycled tried and tested person but you push like okay this individual is not necessarily an aviation specialist i mean for certain roles you can i mean for finance legal marketing you can you can get people because those are transferable skills but that's the whole point of like, yeah, so that uh, you get challenged as well. Your thought uh, process get challenged and you're not just getting someone from Royce Royce into Boeing, but um, you give someone a chance from, uh, I don't know, an Amazon or, or, or um, a completely unrelated sort of, uh, or a retailer. So it's, yeah, that's, that's the. Yeah. I think just to add to that in terms of, um you know just employing i think it, like sort of training to be a teacher or being in a school it's one of the things i kind of i've noted or kind of have some more awareness now, of now it's not yeah you shouldn't you should you should be able to work with someone even if you say don't necessarily like with them or agree with them with their yeah. opinion right so like in the sense that in school like you know people will form their own cliques it's like you know you'll go hang out with your friends at lunchtime etc right but you know if you're choosing maths you know to do so it's more once you get into a workplace, yes, you should be able to work with anyone. So like, if you reach a stage, oh, I can't work with that person because X, Y, Z, and it's not really directly due to the job or, you know, then you've already sort of lost, right? Because, you know, like you you might really like your friend, but your friend might not actually be that good at maths, right? And this other person yeah. that you don't know, right? Or have like, you know, different backgrounds and actually is good at the maths that you need the role to do, right? So. It's just sort of that aspect sometimes of that just having that kind of um you know like kind of view of the organization to try and sometimes also just you know take the 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 personal or you aspect out of it and sort of say oh this is the role that's required these are the functions that we need um how do we fulfill that um but okay. also sometimes yeah you know you might get someone who meets maybe not all the criteria but some of them is like oh how can we maybe adjust ourselves to suit them or vice versa you know it's just there's a sort of a certain amount of give and take in, in that situation yeah and the point that you you've uh, you've um, uh, raised the far with regards to the cliques within an organization i think the bigger the organization it is the more likely that it's going to be basically full of these separate little groups uh, with people who like and uh, and uh, enjoy each other's company basically and then they are going to be very yeah uh, this is i mentioned this whole isolation thing as well as someone who's not coming from the same sort of background so to say sort of either color ethnicity uh, gender um, age it's um yeah i mean it can be quite a humiliating experience as well basically and and and, and, and uh, something that you yeah like the monday morning blues basically like going back to school and then yeah being surrounded by people that you don't necessarily like so it's uh, i think um and and, I, and from my experience 
because I have been in that diversity hire previously in a previous job. Um, yeah, I could not integrate. Basically, I mean, it, it was it was one of those British white middle class kind of uh, uh, group uh, that I could just not. Um, um, be a part of basically or be accepted by and i think it's basically when you really you know we talk about this culture thing values uh, all these fluffy things well they are fluffy until you are experiencing it how it is when it doesn't work out basically that's the i think that's uh, at least that's my experience basically i completely agree I completely agree i think um it can be in, the inclusive style can be sort of overlooked at times, and like you say, and people just just get along with it. But when you aren't included and you're and you are sort of the only one going into a role consistently, and it can be like you say, the small things. Uh, one word we haven't used today that gets used quite often is microaggressions. The small sort of microaggressions of yeah. purposely not yeah. inviting that person to to a meeting or or to after work drinks or to other sort of things where you're like, actually, I would not mind going to that or or, or anything. Um, these things have an impact on, on how you feel on your self-esteem and your character and your day by day to day sort of getting up in the morning. Do I want to go back to that place? And once you start feeling like that, like I say, you can start showing up at work as a much smaller version of yourself. And so you might have your answers or you might want to raise a health and safety concern and you might just not do it because actually I don't really feel much a part of it. No one's going to listen to me anyway. And then later on, that cost the company a lot because nobody yeah. was going to was was listening or giving empowering the, the workers within the organizations to speak up and so the reality is that i think one thing we have to remember is i know we spend a lot of time at our jobs and you, it should be enjoyable but you know you, you're not hiring people to be your friends and and there's no incumbent upon you or anybody in the workplace to like each other but you need to be able to work work together and be collegiate in doing so and there's, there's ways in which you do that and i think actually if you are inviting everybody out for after work drinks the collegiate thing to do is to invite everybody, not to invite the select group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean you. I'm saying you have to have specific friends or whatever within the workplace. It's completely fine for people to have their own groups or their own people that they want to spend time with. But it's a way in which you go about doing that. Are you doing it in a way that creates a culture of exclusivity, where it's just me and my little clique, or are you doing it in a way? Of, you know, sometimes I spend my time with my these friends because we have a lot in common and we get together and talk about that. Other times we open the group up and we just do things that other people like to do at the workplace because it's not just about us. Um, yeah. And that's, that, those, those things. Are exactly, exactly. And it's probably one of the most clickiest thing to do these um, uh, after work drinks. Who gets invited? Who doesn't? Basically, <laughs> I mean, that, that, I mean that, uh, from my experience, they can be quite awkward. Basically, and, and um, yeah, it's basically what do you talk about? Do we have anything in common beyond work? I mean, it's 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 um, um, yeah. I mean, it's 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 um, yeah. How do you navigate those situations? And 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 unfortunately, uh, these are important because um, that's how you can really make sure that are, you are liked, you are respected, you are basically viewed as someone who is sociable. I mean, these nuanced things, unfortunately, play a very important role right from the very beginning, basically, even if you start as an apprentice. I mean, the same things happen. After work activities basically start the, the day you join an organization, basically. So it's, um, yeah, um, could talk about that um, for a few hours, that's, basically, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Um again, wanted to see if the audience has any sort of uh, comments, feedback, questions, anything that uh, that we can address or, or uh, we haven't talked about. I think we did quite a thorough job when it comes to um, mentioning really pretty much all aspects of, uh, uh, of this, unless I'm missing something. I mean, uh, the Farah, um, Jonas, let me know if, if, uh, if there's something that uh, you specifically would like to share, talk about. Um, that we haven't covered. Hey, Arpad, I've sent you some um, questions in the chat that come from the audience. Yeah, one second. Uh... The competencies, yeah. So competencies matter than any competent employees. 
uh, just my view, aviation is multicultural business and we need to rule out any racial issues. I mean, most definitely, basically, that's the, if, if you don't tap into the uh, broader uh, sort of um, um, candidate pool, um, and you don't give uh, opportunities to people who haven't studied aerospace engineering, for example, or aviation management, um, I think you can really just um, uh, miss out on a lot of um, uh, good quality people, basically, that, or at least that's what I'm, I'm seeing. And unfortunately, aviation has this tendency to hire within. It's very inward looking, basically. Well, if, if you don't have a background in it, then a lot of airlines, airports, they disqualify you, basically. That's the, that's the unfortunate um, uh, reality. You know, uh, Johannes, if, if you've seen this or, or uh, the far. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't see the question, but I think, um, yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. And I think um, I just want to quickly say, because you did ask, I was looking around for a link. I'm going to post it in the chat now, but I spoke on quite a lot about inclusive cultures today. And actually, I am running a bit of research looking into inclusive cultures uh, within the engineering community. And it'll be quite interesting to understand. Um, how people within aerospace and the aviation community feel within about the culture of engineering within their organization. So it's a 15 to 20 minute survey. And if I can just plug it very quickly, I'll share it in the chat. Um, it'll be great yeah. if we could get as much, much feedback from as many different engineers as possible, from as many different backgrounds as possible, because um, all everybody, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, sometimes we can talk about, and obviously today we're focused on racial diversity, but when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's important that every group um, within engineering feels included and feels a part of that conversation. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll share that very quickly. No, that would be okay. that would be yeah. helpful. So, so, what was the, so, what was the question? If you don't mind me asking, it's um, it was around um, um, yeah, what happens if you don't um, if you don't include or if you don't. Um, uh, um, um eliminate these racial issues basically within an organization basically aviation is a multicultural business and if it's basically we need to rule out any uh racial issues within it and i would imagine it's basically what are the consequences basically if we don't um i think that that might be the uh the question here uh, okay yeah okay um yeah so you said like one of the, the answers sort of perhaps in maybe a statement or the question itself that particularly for aviation it's such a global industry right in the sense that you know we're making planes airplanes that fly from countries to countries you know like all over the world as in you you will experience different people of different races different cultures you know interracial etc right so perhaps different from if you were I don't know, doing wind engineering somewhere in Scotland, right, where, you know, kind of locally there's a particular, you know, uh, I don't know, type or person, you know, I think with aviation you have to be very mindful that it is by sort of kind of definition we they operate in such a global market. So, you know, it does have to be racially inclusive, right, as in, yeah. you know, if you're going to go to Africa, or like South Africa, for example, right, and like spend some time in SA, you're probably going to see a lot of people of color, you know, black people, if you're going to go to India, right, Mumbai, like yeah. for two weeks or three weeks, you know, do you mean, so like, in a very exactly. obvious way, that's why you actually need exactly. that, right, um, and then, yes, so, you know, um, and it does wonders for the organization as well, because, um, you know, you get diversity of opinion, ideas, solutions, um, and that's good for business. You know, you'd want to know, okay, am I getting a good price on this? I don't know, not even a holiday, this food, or is this like actually authentic to this region, etc. Right? And you can only do that if you're actually diverse and inclusive, right? So it works for everyone. So it works sort of on a macro scale, but also on on the smaller scale. You know, as in if you go to Cape Town and spend I don't know, two days there, you know, and checking out the local stuff, you know, it's, it's just, so I think for aviation in, in itself, it's very important to be diverse and inclusive, you know, and so when, when you step on a plane, you know, it'd be nice to be like, oh, that's, someone looks like me, you know, that sort of thing, or they, you know, they can understand my accent, you know, they don't struggle with my name or you know, that, that sort of thing. So 
or they speak so your language, important. like in the case of Emirates, well, there's always someone who speaks your language, basically, or they have a look at the the passenger yeah. list, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think I think it's important for that, and also sort of what we said right at the start of this. There's also just like the moral aspect of it as well in any organization for everyone to feel heard, to feel included. Society just functions better that way. Um, and yes, there's always, you know, when you start to look at like, you know, recruitment and selection, yes, there is a legal aspect to it and also a business case. Um, yeah. But I think it's just yeah. the right thing to do. Exactly, exactly. And things need to happen at the policy level, at the at the governmental level, really to mandate organizations to really just um, um, stick to it. Not only, uh, there's a lot of lip service, um, uh, but I think when it comes to, like when push comes to shove, I think there are very few organizations who are really practicing what uh, uh, what they preach, basically. I think that's, that, that, at least that's my sort of experience from like specifically this, uh, this industry. You just have to have a look at the um, annual uh, IATA picture of the board of directors basically like just for gender diversity i mean it's getting a little bit better because there are like four or five um female airline ceos there but still it's just uh um uh, yeah could do better basically but yeah 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 and um i i, I mean i i don't have much more to add to, to that i think um the benefits are quite clear to be fair for, for racial diversity and the risks are, are quite clear um for companies that they don't i think there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned i think is for companies depending on which company they are but i think most companies do have to be worried because we're living in a more social media has um a big impact and people are now having an ability now to call companies out for bad products, bad services, yeah. and bad experiences. Um, and if your company is one of these companies that have, uh, haven't have addressed their culture and issues within their culture, you could very, very, very soon find yourself in the middle of a social media storm with a lot of people saying they're no longer gonna buy your products or support your organization anymore based on the experiences that people have had with, with, within your company and organization. So but as been said, there's a business case for this. There's, there's legal case, there's, there's moral case. There's so many different cases. For wide diversity, it needs, and there's so many different risks for for if you don't pay attention to this um, and don't take it seriously, and also just in terms of just putting out good quality products, as, as you say, different people bring different ideas. And within the area of engineering, I mean, not so much for aerospace, I suppose, but like inclusive design, I think it that does work for aerospace and, and and aviation as well. Actually, inclusive design is, is massively important, and thinking about who you're designing yeah. for, the background of those people. I mean, we we've seen things like. Um, hand gel dispensers, for example, that doesn't dispense hand gel for black hands because it doesn't, doesn't recognize them, or or video recognition technology that can't figure out the difference between different black people faces because they haven't done enough testing on those groups. It's very basic things that that go into having good engineering design um, comes down to having diversity and, and 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 inclusion in 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 the way you work. And so, yeah, there's many risks and there's many benefits. And I think, exactly. yeah, I could, I. Could, I could, a lot. Okay. Okay. No, I think uh, on my side, I really um, covered what um, I had uh, in mind or what I what I planned. So unless anyone else has uh, anything else to to add or uh, uh, comment, um, I would like to thank everyone the their time and and uh, and the insights, um, the far and and Johannes, because um, I think we've uh, we've touched on um, really in detail on a wide range of topics that um, I think a lot of people are concerned about or, or are worried about, really. I think it's a, it's a very topical issue and will continue to be um, for the foreseeable future, definitely, until there is um, uh, change. Yeah, nothing to add for my part, but I think it's been amazing to have this conversation and to, to be able to speak directly to the um aerospace aviation community and i think let's just continue these conversations and think about what we could do yeah yeah no, definitely um, Tafara, anything uh any final um, words i know just to add to that i mean it's been um it's been a pleasure actually to be invited to be on a panel and to actually discuss these issues um because yeah often sometimes it can be something that's quite uncomfortable to talk about but in, until we start to have that dialogue and actually look to to make positive change um then like no change will happen. So, um, yeah, no, thank you for uh, listening. You know, thank you for the questions. And um, yeah, this is, it's, it's been really good. It's been an honor.
you know, thank you for the society as well for putting this um, um, on and um, and for inviting us to um, to be part of this and to share our uh, thoughts, views, um, experiences. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, there were a few more questions that did um, come through. Um, if everyone's happy just to answer those quickly. Um, just for uh, anyone, um, how do we think AI might be affecting a cr recruitment? If anyone's got any thoughts on that? Sorry, okay, I'll just quickly go first. I was going to say it depends what what information you use right, to build the algorithms, right? So if you're say looking at aerospace engineering, who's typically working at the company, then it will probably amplify whatever biases are there. You know, it might be white male, you know, dominant. So, um, but you can also use that information as well to um, identify the gaps, as it were. You know, to sort of say, oh, actually, this particular group isn't, you know, represented. You know, what can we do about that? So, I think, um, you know, AI can be very useful and a very powerful tool. Um, and you know, particularly because engineers like numbers. You know, once you have facts and figures, you know, you can then start to see, oh, okay, this is this is clearly a gap here, and then start to maybe understand the reasons why and what needs to be done. So, I think it can, although it might amplify maybe some biases or unconscious biases or etc it can be used to actually to some extent alleviate them or at least um increase or promote not promote but necessarily, but increase diversity and inclusion or at least provide ways of, of you know identifying what areas need to be focused on um and possible solutions and, and routes for that Anis, do you have any comments on that Yeah, no, I just think. So yeah, I just think with AI, I think it's just um, as as Tafari said, it's about the algorithm that's been used to set it up, um, and just thinking very carefully about that. But I think there's a number of, of studies and a lot of research that's gone into this area already, and we know that there's, as Tafari said, any sort of existing biases can easily be copied over into any sort of algorithm or AI, and so we should sort of. I don't think it's, it's about not using these things at all, but I think it's about being very careful, being selective in how you use those things and making sure that you have um, good policies and procedures um, to, to counteract some of the, the biases that may come about for using some of that, those uh, methods in your recruitment processes. Okay, thank you. Arpad, did you have any comment on AI in recruitment? Yeah, I think it's, yeah not making it easier because those um, those um, um, uh, artificial intelligence induced programs and selection processes I mean who knows who put them puts them together who knows what are the, the criterias that they're uh, being programmed um, um, into so it's I think it's uh, it can be um, a positive because there's no human involvement at the very early stages basically and, and maybe there's no uh, um, bias when it comes to names and all that but um, uh, you never know I think it's, it's uh, I would be quite cautious about uh, relying on these AI methods um, uh, at an advanced stage of the recruitment process maybe at the very beginning do you have the degree not things like that I think it could be useful but uh, uh, to make real decisions, I think that's not the right thing. Thank you. Um, another question that we had was, uh, you mentioned about panel uh, interviews. I think, Johan, you mentioned it. Um, somebody asked, Does the, have, have any of you had any experiences of panel interviews? And if so, what were your views on that experience? I don't know if Johan, you want to go first? Yeah, so most of uh, most, if not all, my interviews have been panel um, interviews. Um, so two to three people interviewing me or, or, or taking part in the interview process. And I think, for me, I, I like I said, I, I prefer. I think it, it gives you a good sort of opportunity to, to see to, to a different group of people and different group of people to present sort of different energies and different ways of working. And that allows you and yourself to sort of, to be okay to present your own different way, energy and your own different way of working. And I think that that's important. I don't have any negative experiences of, of panel um, interviews per se, uh, um, um, on the basis of there being panels, um, and at the same time, I've never had an individual interview, so I don't know what that would be like. And um, I think I find that quite awkward, to be fair, just to be judged solely by the opinion and choice 
or just to one person. Um, that, that's just me. Laura, do you have any views? Okay, on I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've experienced with both panel interviews and single interviews. Um, I'd say that I, my experience of panel interviews has actually been quite good because sometimes, you know, one interviewer will ask me a question and I don't quite understand the question. The other person will maybe just rephrase it, right? And then it's like, oh, okay, that's what you mean to say. So I think it's it's good for that. And I suppose when you have two interviewers, they can bounce off each other. They know possibly like, you know, what the type of person they're looking for. So it just makes you feel more at ease because it's like, oh, okay, you know, you know, maybe think of it this way or that way. So my experience of panel interviews has always been um, quite positive. Um, single interviews, um, I've had situations where for a particular, say, role, you know, I have a series of single interviews. Again, I think that's fine. So long as um, possibly at the end of the day, it's not just one person making the decision. Let's say, uh, you know, you have two single interviews for two different people or even three, then okay, that's fine. Um, but yeah, sometimes they can be a bit, uh, they can be a bit intimidating, but also it's then, um, you know, their I suppose, perception of how good of a candidate you are, right? So you could have two different people interviewing you, asking the exact same question, and probably what each of them will evaluate will be different, right? About you would be different sort of thing. So which is the benefit of a panel interview? Right, so um, so I think that's my take on it. It's it's sort of I, I prefer them, but also I think uh, single interviews sometimes aren't necessarily a bad thing, so long as you have, you know, maybe other assessment criteria. Great, thank you. Um, Arpa, do you have any experience of um, panel interviews or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's tricky because you have to really pay attention to your body language, the eye contact. Um, you have to ask a lot of questions because you've got a lot of people to to uh, <laughs> to impress. Um, I would suggest that you bring a copy of your CV as well uh, for each person on the panel if they haven't got it yet, and really just be ready to take notes, build rapport, and and try to make a strong connection basically with with all the three, four, five people that, uh, or maybe even more um tricky i mean it's, it's easier said than done but um, um if you practice and if you really just um uh, um, uh make sure that um that um you do a, a dry run i think you can be very successful at it as well so, uh, thank you um you mentioned cv somebody asked uh, regarding cv writing how does an entry-level cv differ from a graduate so is anyone going to go first on that that keep it sweet, short, uh, but also really try to focus on the things that you've actually achieved rather than the job description from a previous role. I think the same applies for uh, any level. Don't just regurgitate your job description <coughs> from a from an internship or from a summer scheme or whatever you did previously. But uh, try to think about yourself as a try to th view yourself as a solution provider, as a CEO of one. And then basically just um, uh, show them, bridge the gap between their issues, problems, and how you are the solution to the issues that the organization is uh, facing. Because businesses are not uh, hiring people to uh, have a bum on a seat, even at junior level, but to really just uh, yeah solve uh, business critical issues. Basically. So that would be my sort of topic. Anyone else have any comments on that? What well, Arpad said, I think um, he's, he's a recruiter, and so I, I definitely think, uh, definitely just want to double down on that and back that up. I think that is the best way. But I think what, what I was doing very wrong at the first place was answering the sort of recruitment question very literally, which sort of like, why would you be good, a good fit for this role you know, without paying too much attention to the, the overall job description and everything else? And quite often, recruiters are quite, are quite clear in what they're looking for, and they're almost telling you what, what you need to have. Um, and Nobody told me that, I suppose. So when I was looking at job description and initially, I was just looking, oh, I would love this job. I'd be really good at it. And I would just write about all this sort of probably good reason, um, but they're not specific to the job description itself. And I think um, just, just being aware that actually read, read very clearly what the recruiter is asking for and, and refer back to specifically what they're asking for rather than passions that you might have that might be somewhat related, but you haven't made the clear link between your, your experience within that, er that work and uh and and the, the the desired role that they have 
I think just yeah, I'll add to that. So I think what Johanna said um, sort of earlier, like so with my university, they were very good at giving career advice, right? So by the, when you actually enter from day one, you know, there's a lot of support in that, you know, regard. So, uh, you know, we had workshops on how to write a CV, you know, um, I attended a lot of career fairs, not even sometimes to even apply for a job, just because, but because some big companies are coming and always encourage you to go and have a chat. So I think, um, some like from the university level, initially there was quite a lot of support, um, and so you sort of knew how to write a CV or the types of things to to put there. You could even ask to have like a mock interview and that sort of stuff. So um, I think that was initially quite helpful. But I think you know, as time went on, it, it is about reading the job description. You know, also doing some of the research, um, uh, and the internet's actually very useful for that. Um, and I think, you know, when you're unsuccessful, sometimes you know why you're unsuccessful. It's like, I actually, that wasn't a very good interview. You know, I didn't do well at the technical questions and it was kind of technical role. And so you might have some suspicions of why you didn't get it. But I think that's when feedback is often quite useful. Um, but I think, I'm, or at least I found that you normally only get feedback when you've reached a certain stage in the recruitment process. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's worth bearing that in mind um so so yes i think it's when it comes to cvs or maybe the types of jobs you're applying for you know um try and you know if if the help isn't like sort of obviously available then try and get it um and even you know with some companies if you're looking to progress to the next level you know or for a promotion you know they'll have some sort of internal system that probably be, will show you the type of skill set you need for that and that sort of stuff so um yeah great thank you i think we've got time for a couple more questions so um one here is do you think uh recruitment processes should focus more on providing feedback on applications especially if they're unsuccessful so who'd like to go first on that one uh, maybe i will um, I don't think so, um, because organizations are in the business of finding the right candidate as quick as possible and not in the business of providing feedback. I know that it's helpful, useful, and you really um, need it, um, especially when you have been unsuccessful. Uh, but you have to really view it from their perspective that it's basically you can't just get back to thousands, potentially um, tens of thousands of people in the case of like the um, the Googles, the Amazons, the Prime Airs, and uh, like, uh, it, it's, just, uh, it's just not a productive and good use of time from an organizational uh, perspective. I know that this is not what uh, you wanted to hear, but this is where they are coming from and it is unlikely to change, especially if you've been rejected at the early stages of the recruitment process. I think when you got to the interview stage, you've been one of the finalist ones, then you really need to push for it. I think that I would agree with that, that you really need to know why exactly you were not the right one. But at an early stage, uh, you can't expect that um, uh, this, will, this will ever happen. Really. Does anyone else have any comments on that? Yeah, I think I think Arthur's um, right. I think um, I think. Sorry, do you want to go to far? No, no, no. Keep going. Yeah, um, so yeah, so I think I think definitely at the, um, for especially for some of the larger companies, and there's something that we found in in recent as well that there's not a uh, a culture of giving feedback within within these industries, and I think actually it makes sense because um, as you say, it's very difficult. Companies are focused on on what they're doing that's going to be time effective and going to be financially viable. Obviously, ideally, it would be great if everyone could have re feedback and things like this but it's not necessarily the way that things work um what i would say is i, I would suggest that possibly one thing that to consider is actually what now that we're doing more of this this sort of automatic ai sort of um, processes um in in recruitment that perhaps a um companies doing that should think about including with that automatic feedback to go back to the candidates who are rejected you are rejected because you did not have this, you didn't have the correct um, um, degree for this role. You didn't have this. I think that things like that could be quite simple for a company, time effective and useful for candidates that's um, uh, applying, but at the same time, it's that, that a company who does that is doing it almost in many ways going above and beyond. Um, they don't really have 
they don't have to do that sort of thing uh, in many ways. And I think there is, but on the, uh, on the flip side, I think there is a question around so companies that do want to diversify and increase diversity, um, to think about using the data they have to understand if we are not getting sort of candidates coming through, if they're getting rejected at this stage, and they're getting rejected because their CV or whatever it is that they're doing is it, it, it isn't good enough or up to standard, that perhaps there is more that can be done by that company to say, hey, we'll, we will support programs that support ethnic minority engineers, et cetera, to improve on their employability skills. And that's, that could be the contribution as opposed to giving out feedback to every individual. And there's plenty of different programs that exist like that already that work with young engineers uh, from minority ethnic backgrounds and other backgrounds that are underrepresented to give them the employability skills that are, are vital that they, they might not have received at university. So there's, there's other ways to go about it. Yeah, I think just to kind of add to both points, um, I've always thought, sort of thought like, well, I think I suppose what um, Arp had said sort of matches with my experience. Normally I, I get feedback if I sort of get to the later stages of the, you know, the process, you know, when you're sort of shortlisted and you're like one of the finalists, I think there it's it's fair enough to ask for feedback. But um, certainly in, in the earlier stages, you know, especially with some roles that have, you know, a lot of applicants, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's no, there's no value for money for the company, right? But I think that if you provide feedback, you know, for the finalists, that's all, that will also help you with diversity and inclusion, right? So if you can tell someone, oh, actually, we liked this, right? But this is why you didn't get it, or, you know, at least they know, but also it, it shows as a company that you've identified, okay, this is why we haven't chosen that candidate, right? right? Yeah. Um, and so it's it, it, it then it's a, it's a mutually beneficial thing. The candidate thinks, oh, okay, I didn't get it, but you know they gave me something to work on. Um, but also as an organization, you've also highlighted, okay, you know that person got quite close. This is what they were lacking, you know. And, and then you can also use that, right? So then it's a two-way thing, um, rather than I suppose you know yeah expecting you know feedback at an earlier stages where maybe there were a lot of typos in your cover letter or you know you, you didn't really read the job description properly, etc. You know, so I think it's yeah. there's an element of it, but I also think you as a candidate, you know, you can probably, without kind of being paranoid, make some sort of assessment as to why you probably didn't get it. You know, sometimes you can just sort of say, actually, mm, you know, what 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 is the market that they're into, and you don't know, and you're like waffling. You know, and I think you also have to take ownership of that, right? Um, and yeah. So, so yeah, for me, it's, you know, and sometimes you can ask for feedback and they just don't give it to you. There's no harm in asking. The worst they can say is no, which it's fine, you know, so, yeah. And even sometimes, sometimes the feedback, you know, you won't even necessarily agree with it, um, but perhaps you can see why they've come to that conclusion, you know? So that's also like, also useful because maybe, you know, there was something that you were doing like, you know, unconscious bias, but, and so their feedback will actually sort of say, oh, okay. Why did they think that of me? Oh, what was I doing? And then, you know, so I think it works both ways. I don't think that just because you get feedback, it means that you'll be better for the next job application, but at least you have more information. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Thank you. And the last question that we had was, um, does anyone have any, um, I know we are talking about sort of racial diversity with this event, but somebody's asked about a point of um, age inclusion. So maybe including younger people, um, but also maybe even older people that are changing careers as well. Um, does anyone want to start on that one? Generally, I just think more needs to be done in regards to age, and I think it's one of those things in DNI that is the least, probably the least one uh, of the protected characteristics that we refer to and we look into. Uh, we look into gender, relatively well, LGBTQ plus, um, um, ethnicity, and disability um, at varying rates nowadays. But I think with age, there's so sort of, uh, there's very few reports that I can call to mind that have been. Um, written about age uh, within within the industry of engineering specifically, and I think where it comes into place is the interest in the intersection of women and engineering um, and and age, and that you know women who have had babies or have left the profession for for that reason, etc. Who um, they not they don't re-enter the the, um, the profession at the same rate, and and I think age has a, has a has had some role to do with that as well. Being a bit older, having been out of the profession for a little while. Are people, are people being retrained for, um, put, um, correctly to go back into the profession at, at a level that they, they deserve to be at, or are they being sort of fogged off at, at, at sort of having to almost restart careers and, and be put into other 
other positions. I think this is something that really does need to be looked into, and there's not enough data on it from my perspective. I think also for younger people, so how are you treated once you first get in the workplace? Are you empowered, or are you sort of, is there sort of belief that you're young, and so therefore you have to go through this specific process before anyone takes you seriously? There's many different ways that this that age plays um, a part, um, but there's not enough data or research for me to speak too confident uh, on it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, age is an interesting one because um, sometimes it can be a good metric and sometimes it's just actually not that useful, right? Um, because it's sometimes I just look at the experience, right? Like, you know, let's say how much experience you have, you know, in that particular, are you looking for someone who's experienced or are you looking for someone who has little experience that you're going to train up, right? So, you know, that person could be 22, that person could be 42, right? But like, let's say, you know, you're looking for someone with maybe no prior experience, but with certain things. So it's it's a tricky one. Um, but I think that, you know, yeah, I know some people who, let's say they want to have a family, they'll maybe take a career break, right? And then maybe if they want to then now continue their career, okay, they're older, right? So you might say, oh, there's been a gap, but there's a reason for that. So age is a tricky one. And yeah, you could decide to have a bit of a career change, I don't know, 40, you know? So it's just, I mean, it's not something I think about too much because I think a lot of the time, you know, with a, it's it's more about like what your you know situation is, right? In terms of maybe the type of role that you'll go for, etc. You know, um, do you want to travel? You know, um, you know, are you happy to do that, or are you quite sort of you know you just want to be settled in one place? So, yeah, um, and even oh. so, so with Jackson before he was saying that his program is for between thirteen and twenty five year olds, and I was like, I, and I'd be quite interested in the program, but I'm thirty two, so like you know like I'm ready I'm discounted so it's just you know for sometimes you'll yeah it's it, it is what it is um do you have any thoughts on that question yeah I mean the reason why it's important is because there we have an aging population in terms of like people are living longer people are choosing to to, to work much later in life basically the whole industry has this uh, uh, retirement issue a lot of people are retiring every every year you really need to consider those who want to um, um, still be active um, a lot of people are in a position where they are unable to retire um, due to various financial constraints. Um, and, and yeah, as uh, the Farah pointed out, a lot of people are making career changes later in life and they don't want to uh, retire. And let's not forget about those uh, boomers, baby boomers, who are still very much supporting uh, their millennial uh, children living at home, basically, and they need an income. So why do you um, deny them? That, that's my sort of um, a lot of a lot more discussion needs to be um, dedicated to that, uh, that and then the various generational differences at, at, uh, at um, the workplace and yeah all the implications yeah um, that was it for all the questions so uh, thank you everyone for coming to this webinar um, thank you to RPAD for chairing and our panellists, Johannes, Tafara and Jackson. Um, yeah, so um, this has been recorded. So um, anyone that wants to uh, catch up, uh, rewatch it again, share it with um, friends that they can do. Um, it will be on the Society YouTube channel uh, very, very soon. Um, but yeah, thank yeah. you again. And I hope, you, hope everyone enjoys uh, their evening. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for the opportunity again. Um, okay. Thanks everyone. Bye. You're right. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.